Hi everyone, this is lesson five of Growing in Grace. Last time we talked about how God created the world and everything in it, and today we are going to be talking about how God preserves his creation, how God continues to take care of the world that uh, he made. So our uh, lesson question then today, how does God preserve the world? And the answer to that question is, is found in the first article of the Apostles' Creed. So uh, we go back to the Apostles' Creed, uh, which we started talking about last time. And uh, the Apostles' Creed, um, the explanation for it there, uh, what does this mean? First of all, it, it talks about how God created uh, the world, how God created us. Um, and then it goes on to talk about how God continues to preserve us in this world. I believe that God still preserves me by richly and daily providing clothing and shoes, food and drink, property and home, spouse and children, land, cattle, and all I own and all I need to keep my body and life. God also preserves me by defending me against all danger, guarding and protecting me from all evil. And why does God do this? Well, all this God does only because he is my good and merciful Father in heaven, and not because I have earned or deserved it. For all this I ought to thank and praise to serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Uh, so those are the, the things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, how God preserves us, and why he preserves us, and uh, how we show our thanks uh, for that. So, uh, to help us talk about some of those things, we are first going to read uh, from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17, verses 7 through 16. This is the account of uh, the prophet Elijah and the widow in the town of Zarephath. Uh, so just a little bit of context here before we read that. Uh, the whole uh, region, not just the promised land, not just Israel, uh, but really the whole region, the whole Middle East, we might say today, uh, was in the middle of a drought so severe uh, that there was little food anywhere uh, to eat. And so uh, God sent the prophet Elijah to a woman and her son in a town outside of Israel, to the northwest of Israel, called Zarephath. All right, so it's a time of drought. God has sent the prophet Elijah uh, out of Israel uh, to uh, this, this town called Zarephath, where he meets this, uh, this woman, this widow. So uh, let's read that section then. Uh, go ahead and pause uh, the video and read through those verses. All right, let's look at the questions then on page 20. Uh, number one, God sent Elijah to a widow who had no food for her and her son. Uh, she was picking up some sticks to start a small fire. She was going to use the very last of the, uh, the flour and the oil that she had to make one last loaf of bread, and she and her son were going to eat it and then um, prepare for, for death, essentially. They, they were ready to starve to death because uh, there just was no food. Now, if you were the widow and Elijah, this, this stranger, comes into town and he asked you for food, uh, how might you have responded? Take some time just to discuss that. All right, there uh, obviously is no right answer here. Uh, maybe you guys are more generous than I am, but I think if I had just enough food left for one last meal for my family and, and then some stranger came and uh, asked me to give it to him instead, I, I don't think there's any way that I would have uh, shared that food uh, with this stranger. Um, and so to this woman's uh, credit, uh, she is, is willing to 
uh, to do this, to be generous with, uh, with the prophet Elijah. Now, number two, God promised that the oil and flour would not run out until it rained again. What would have made that promise difficult to believe? What would have made the promise difficult to believe? Well, uh, the widow knew that she had just a little bit of oil and flour left. Uh, she knew that the drought had lasted a long time already. Uh, there was no guarantee, um, no indication that it was going to be raining anytime soon. And so you know, common sense says that uh, if you have only a little bit of food left and you eat that, that little bit of food, then you don't have anything uh, remaining, right? Um, it just isn't our experience that uh, you uh, take everything out of your fridge and then open it again and, and there's more food there or, or uh, you take bread out of your pantry and then uh, the next morning all of a sudden there's just more bread there. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that usually. And so um, this would have been extremely difficult to, uh, to believe that the oil and flour would, uh, would not uh, run out for uh, for who knows how long until it rained. Number three, what was special about the woman, her son, or Elijah that would cause God to work such a miracle to take care of them? That's exactly what this is, a miracle. And we'll talk more about miracles in just a, a few minutes. Um, but was there something special um, about any of these people uh, that, that caused God to, uh, to work in such a way? Uh, was there something special about any of these people? Well, the answer is that no, there really wasn't anything particularly special about these people. Nothing special enough that somehow they had earned a miracle uh, from God. Uh, certainly Elijah was a prophet of the Lord, and um, and we do see some of the, the miracles that he was able to do and, and his bravery and standing up to the king and so on um, elsewhere in, in First Kings. Uh, but when it comes down to it, uh, being a prophet of the Lord doesn't somehow make him holier or, or better or more deserving in God's sight. Uh, we see the woman's generosity, but uh, again, it's not as if um, this one act of generosity uh, is enough to, to earn something good from God. Uh, the fact is that none of us uh, deserve good things from God. None of us are able to be good enough people to... Um, to to earn things, to deserve things uh, from God. It doesn't work that way. Uh, God took care of this woman and her son and Elijah uh, because of his grace. And when we talk about God's grace, we're talking about his undeserved love, which is exactly the, the same reason that he uh, takes care of us. Uh, we, we saw that in the explanation of the first article above there. All this God does because he is my good and merciful father in heaven, not because I have earned or deserved it. Uh, because of our sin, really the only thing that we deserve from God is punishment and suffering and, and eternal death and hell. That's, that's really what we deserve. Uh, but God provides for us. God does all of these wonderful things for us and gives blessings to us uh, because uh, he loves us dearly, even, even though we don't deserve that love. Number four, God does not typically provide for us through miracles, though he certainly can. Uh, read Psalm 104, verse 14. How does God typically provide the things that we need?
All right, how does God typically provide the things that we need? Uh, he does it through uh, natural means. So, uh, for example, there in, in that verse, verse 14, right, how does he provide food for, uh, for cattle? Uh, well, he does it by causing grass to grow. How does he provide for the grass to make it grow? Well, he, he provides uh, sunlight and rain and so on. Um, and the same thing is true for us. How does God give us food by making plants uh, grow uh, and so on? Uh, typically, uh, like we said before, food doesn't just appear in the fridge or in the pantry. Um, food doesn't typically rain down from the sky like it did for, uh, for Moses and the Israelites when they were wandering through the wilderness. Usually God provides for us in natural ways, through natural means. And let's, uh, let's define that. When we talk about natural means, we're talking about uh, the processes that God built into creation uh, for taking care of us. So when God uh, created the world, uh, he created it in such a way uh, that it was able to um, to work in, in such a way that, that it would provide uh, things for us, that it would uh, work uh, for our uh, survival. Okay, now let's let's talk a little bit more about that number five here. Uh, how does God use natural means to provide for us on a daily basis? Maybe just think through that, uh, discuss that a little bit. Uh, what natural processes does God use each day to uh, give you the things that you need? All right, uh, we have some examples here. Uh, God uses the sun and the rain to cause crops to grow. Uh, God places us in uh, families, gives us parents to care for us when we're younger. Uh, he gives us skills and abilities to, to work and to earn a living. Um, and, and maybe we don't usually think of God as the one who is behind uh, all of these things, but he absolutely is. Um, God is the one who provides for us uh, by means of these very uh, seemingly ordinary sorts of, of things. But this is all part of God's design. Uh, God designed uh, the sun to shine and, and the rain to fall for the purpose of providing food for us. God designed the family uh, for uh, the, the welfare of, of children. Um, God designed our bodies and our brains to be able to uh, work and earn a living for ourselves and so on. So this is this is all part of God's plan uh, for uh, for us, even if it seems so ordinary. Okay, number six. Uh, God doesn't always provide for us through natural means. Sometimes he uses a miracle to take care of us like he did for Elijah and the widow and uh, her son. And, and let's define that while we're talking about it. What's a miracle? A miracle is something that God does uh, beyond the natural processes of the world. Uh, a miracle is when God um, pauses or bypasses the, the laws of physics or the, the laws of nature or whatever it might be uh, to do something special, to do something extraordinary. We said that usually it doesn't work that you just open the fridge and more food appears there. Uh, that, that doesn't follow the natural uh, laws of, of physics or nature, however you want to say it. Um, but this is God doing something uh, unusual, unexpected, something that goes above and beyond the way that things normally work. And God is omnipotent, right? That's the word that we uh, saw last time. He is all-powerful. Um, and so he is able to uh, to do this. He is able to uh, do things that, that we aren't able to do. He's able to do things that go uh, beyond the, the natural processes and laws uh, of this world. Okay, number seven, whether God provides through miracles or by natural means, 
What can you be certain that God will always do for you? Read Psalm 145, verses 15 and 16. You can always be absolutely certain that God will provide what we need for our lives in this world. Uh, usually he does it by natural means. Uh, he can do it by working miracles. Uh, but in either case, we can be sure that God will open his hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing, that, that he will give us what we need in our lives. Uh, not necessarily everything that we might want, in life, uh, but he will, uh, he promises to give us what we need, food, clothing, shelter, uh, things like that. All right, and this is called preservation. Uh, what's What are we talking about when we talk about preservation, God preserving the world? Uh, we're talking about the fact that God continues to take care of the world that he created through natural means and or miracles. Uh, God preserves the world. He keeps it going, keeps it running. Uh, God did not simply create the world and then say, okay, I'm done, and step away and, and say, well, let's see what, what happens. Uh, I have no idea. Um, God continues to take an active, personal interest in the world that he made. Uh, he continues to, uh, to take care of the world uh, every day to take care of us in the world every day. And we are going to be talking more about God's preservation uh, by providing us with daily bread in Lesson 28 when we talk about the Lord's Prayer, Give Us Today Our Daily Bread. Uh, really, that is a prayer asking God to give us the things that we need in life, to preserve our lives in this world. Um, and and we'll, we'll come back to this and, and talk more about it then. All right, uh, number eight then, middle of page 21. Why has God promised to take care of us and provide for us? We talked about this one already, right? Why has God promised to take care of us? Uh, simply because he loves us, uh, not because we deserve it. Um, we shouldn't think that God gives us food or clothing or shelter because we are such wonderfully good uh, people, that God owes us something. Uh, not at all. Uh, God does this because he loves us. He loves the world uh, that he made. Um, and... Uh, and so he provides for us. All right, number nine. God also takes care of us by protecting us from bad things. Uh, read Psalm 50, 15. What's one way that God deals with bad things that come into our lives? Uh, we're going to be looking up a series of passages here. You might want to uh, pause for each of these. Make sure you, you open up to that uh, verse and, and read these as we go. Uh, so let's open up to Psalm 50, verse 15. See if you can find there one way that God deals with the bad things uh, that come into our lives.
All right, one way that God deals with bad things that come into our lives, sometimes God rescues us from trouble. So maybe it's uh, a sickness. You get sick, but then God rescues you, delivers you from that sickness. Or uh, you sustain an injury, and God gives you healing. So that's something bad that happens, but then God uh, delivers you, rescues you, fixes uh, that that bad situation. Okay? Uh, number 10, read Romans 8.28. What's another thing that God will do with bad things in our lives? All right, so another thing that God does with bad things in our lives is to work them uh, for our good. He promises that he uses the bad things that we experience uh, for our good, uh, to uh, strengthen our faith. That's a, a good uh, thing, uh, to teach us to rely on him rather than on ourselves, uh, to get us to think about our lives and our priorities in life, perhaps. Uh, so there are times when God um, allows something bad to happen to us, um, and maybe he doesn't uh, deliver us right away from that bad thing. Maybe he doesn't deliver us from that bad thing for a very long time. Maybe sometimes someone uh, gets sick and uh, they aren't healed. They, they live with that condition for the rest of their lives. Um, or someone gets seriously injured and they have to deal with uh, those injuries um, for uh, the rest of their lives or, or whatever else um, you might be able to think of. Sometimes God doesn't immediately uh, take those bad things away, but he does promise that he will use those things for our good. Uh, Romans chapter 8, the book of Romans was written by uh, the Apostle Paul, and, and the Apostle Paul knows exactly uh, what he's writing about here. Uh, because the Apostle Paul, um, he tells us in some of his letters that we have in, in the Bible, uh, that he suffered from a thorn in the flesh. And we don't know exactly what this thorn in the flesh was. It seems to be some sort of, of uh, condition or illness uh, that he suffered from really for his entire uh, life. And there are different guesses about what it might have been. Um, but whatever it was, he had this, this physical condition that caused him suffering, uh, that, that he suffered from, it seems, for his entire life. And uh, he prayed to God um, repeatedly, several times, Lord, take this thorn uh, from my flesh. Take this physical suffering from me. Give me healing. Deliver me from this bad thing. Um, and God told him, no, I'm not going to. Um, I am going to allow this to continue in your life, but I'm going to use it for your good. I am going to use this uh, to teach you to rely on my strength, not your own strength, Paul. Paul was a, a brilliant man, a talented man, um, a courageous man, all sorts of wonderful gifts. It would have been very easy for Paul and tempting for Paul uh, to... Uh, get a little bit cocky and arrogant and, and start thinking that he was just an amazing sort of guy who accomplished all sorts of things on his own. And God uses this, this condition to remind Paul that, that real strength comes from God, not from ourselves. He wanted to teach Paul to rely, to rely on him, to rely on God. Um, and so that's one example of God allowing bad things, but then using them, changing them, transforming them uh, to, to serve for our good. All right, number 11, read Psalm 91, 9 through 12. What is another thing that God might do with the bad things in our lives? Go ahead. I probably want to pause again, turn to those verses, uh, see if you can answer that question.
All right, sometimes uh, God uh, keeps disaster away from us, right? He might stop bad things before they even uh, get near us. Uh, and uh, we really uh, don't have any idea of how many times that God uh, does this for us. Um, accidents that God uh, prevents uh, before they happen. Um, tragedies that God stops in their tracks before uh, they, they affect us, things like that. Um, tornadoes or storms or earthquakes, other natural disasters that, that God uh, keeps from, from happening. Sometimes God simply says, no, this bad thing is not going to come into the life of uh, this person. He keeps that disaster away uh, from us. All right, uh, 12, uh, looking at those verses again, how does God often protect us from bad things? How does God often protect us? Uh, he protects us by sending his angels. Uh, he sends his angels to, uh, to guard us, watch over us, to, uh, to keep harm from, uh, from coming our way. Uh, the angels, well, let's, let's talk about the, the term here. Angels are spiritual beings that serve God. Uh, so angels are, are spiritual beings. That means that they are real uh, beings. Uh, they, they really exist. Angels are very, very real. Uh, but they are spirits. They don't have physical uh, bodies. Uh, the angels were created uh, by God uh, during the six days of creation. We aren't told in the Bible exactly when, uh, on what day of creation the angels were made. Uh, but they were created along with everything else that exists um, during those six days of creation. Um, we know that uh, at some point uh, there was a group of angels led by the devil, uh, Satan, Lucifer, different titles that he has, uh, led by, by the devil. Uh, some of the angels rebelled against God and were cast out of heaven. Uh, we now refer to those evil angels as, as demons. Demons are also very, very uh, real. Uh, but the good angels continue to uh, serve God. And one of the ways that they serve God is by uh, watching over us, protecting us. Uh, you've probably heard... Um, of this idea of people having a guardian angel. And the Bible never tells us exactly how God sends angels to, uh, to uh, watch over us. Is there one angel assigned to each person? Um, are there multiple angels assigned to, to some people at some times? Uh, we don't have those sort of specific details. Uh, there's nothing in scripture that says that each person has their own um, individual a guardian angel or something like that, although that certainly is a possibility. Uh, but the Bible does tell us that God sends these powerful spiritual beings to watch over us and, mm -hmm. and protect us and keep us safe. Okay, uh, now number 13. Look at Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 33. Again, uh, you'll want to pause and, and turn to those and read them. If we worry about food or clothes, what does that say about our trust in God. What does uh, worry say about our trust in God? Well, when we worry, it, it means really that we don't trust God to help us, to provide uh, for us. Really, worry is the opposite 
of trust. Uh, when we're worried about something, um, it's because uh, there's there's a part of us that just doesn't believe, that just doesn't think that God is actually going to come through this time, that he's not going to give us the things that we need uh, in the future. Uh, we can trust God. God means it when he says that he's going to provide for us, preserve us in this world, give us the things that we need. And so that means we don't we don't need to worry. We don't need to be afraid that God might forget about us or, or that God might not give us what we need. Uh, he absolutely will. Now, number 14, what's the difference between worry and being concerned? When does concern turn into worry? Uh, why is worry uh, sinful when being concerned about something isn't? Discuss some of those things. See if you can find a distinction there. All right, so a difference between worry and concern. Maybe this is one way of, of putting it. Uh, worry expresses doubt that God can help. Uh, concern sees a problem and trusts God uh, to help. Um, so uh, slightly different uh, different things here. Um, if someone, let's, let's uh, take uh, one example here. Uh, let's say that someone uh, loses their job. They get laid off. Uh, and um, how do they react? Well, I, I'm sure that they are concerned, obviously, about this situation, concerned about how they might make a living and afford uh, uh, food and, and clothing and shelter and everything else. Um, obviously, that person will be concerned and I'm sure that they will pray to God and and um, and hopefully will trust God to help. Uh, worry takes that a, a step further. Worry um, is this idea that God isn't going to help me. God has abandoned me. I'm all on my own. What am I going to do? This is hopeless. That sort of a thing. Um, so when we're concerned about something, we we uh, we acknowledge that yes, this is a problem. This is an issue. Um, and I'm going to turn to God. I'm going to put my trust in him um, and, and rely on him to help. Okay, number 15. How can we show our thanks to God for providing for us and preserving us? See if you can come up with some suggestions there. How can we uh, show our thanks to God for, for all of these, these wonderful things that he does for us? Well, uh, we can be content. That means being satisfied and happy with what God uh, gives to us rather than grumbling and complaining because we feel like we don't have enough or we don't have as much as, as so-and-so or something like that. Um, God doesn't have to give us anything. Uh, we don't deserve anything uh, from God. Like we said before, everything that he gives to us um, is is a wonderful gift, a wonderful blessing. Um, and so we can be content with uh, the things that God gives to us uh, each day without always complaining and grumbling and wanting more. Um, and we can be thankful. We can express our thanks to God uh, for all of these things. Uh, going back to the first article of the Apostles' Creed near the end there, uh, for all of this I ought to thank and praise to serve and obey him. So one of the ways that we show our thanks is not just by, by praying to God and saying thank you, um, but uh, we show our thanks also by serving God, obeying him gladly, uh, joyfully. Uh, he does all of these things for us, things that we don't deserve. Uh, of course, we want to 
uh, to uh, obey him. We want to do the things that he asks us uh, to do because we are so, so thankful. Let's look at that chart then at the bottom of page 22. When we talk about God preserving his creation, uh, there there are uh, these, these um, P words here that uh, all go together. So God preserves his creation. How? He provides for us and he protects us. All right, so preservation, when we're talking about God preserving us, keeping us alive in this world, um, he does that by providing and protecting. He provides for us, like we talked about, usually by natural means, although he can do it by miracles. He provides for us uh, richly and daily. That's a, a phrase from the first article that we haven't touched on uh, yet. And just think about how richly God provides uh, for us. Um, he would be keeping his promise to us if he gave us, um, you know, just a little bit of food each day, um, one uh, set of, of clothes to wear. Uh, you can wear the same thing every day if you have to. Uh, giving us a little shack to uh, to sleep in and, and keep the, the rain and snow off of us. That That is technically um, all we need to survive in this world, right? Um, and yet God richly provides for us. He gives us so much more than one set of clothes and a little scrap of food to eat and, and some little shack to, to sleep in. Uh, he gives us so many blessings, blessings that it's very easy for us to take for granted. Um, but just think for a moment of how richly God has provided for you. He provides for us every day. This is an ongoing, everyday thing. And, and we'll talk about that when we talk about our daily uh, bread in the Lord's Prayer. So God preserves us by providing for us. God preserves us by protecting us. That means sometimes he just keeps the evil away from us before it even gets near. Sometimes God does allow the evil to come near to affect us, to cause suffering in our lives. But even then, he promises that he will make that evil thing uh, serve for uh, our good. He will turn that um, into uh, a blessing in one way or another. And uh, very often he protects us by sending uh, these thousands of superhuman angels. These are, are beings that have uh, what we would consider to be superhuman uh, strength and, and power and glory and so on. Uh, these are powerful beings that God is sending to watch over us. Sometimes uh, maybe when we think of angels, uh, we think of like medieval artwork where they're portrayed as cute little chubby babies with wings and wearing diapers and oh those are those cute angels uh, that that's not uh, what angels really are angels are uh, powerful beings beings of of light and and fire um, the the first thing uh, when angels uh, appear to people in the bible and there are a number of times when angels suddenly appear to people in the bible uh, the the very first thing that they have to say to people is don't be afraid Right? Don't be afraid because um, when people see angels, see their power and glory, the first reaction is to, to be afraid because uh, these are, are powerful, glorious beings. Um, and the wonderful news is that God controls these beings and he sends them to watch over us, to take care of us, to protect us. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. All right, so going to the lesson question then, how does God preserve uh, the world. Uh, he provides what we need through natural means and or miracles, and he protects us from bad things and uses them for our good. So again, we have those words that start with P there. He preserves us by providing and protecting. All right, then let's go uh, to our homework. Uh, memory work from the catechism. We're going to do the rest of the first article. Uh, so last time uh, we memorized the first article through my mind and all my abilities. Um, for this lesson we're going to do uh, the rest. So, and I believe that God still preserves me uh, all the way through. This is most certainly true. Um, that is a longer section so we won't have any Bible passage memory work. 
Uh, you should be able to define some key terms and again keep up with these key terms as uh, as we go. Uh, natural means, miracle, preservation, angel. Uh, please read through pages 137 to 142 in Luther's Catechism. And then please uh, also complete worksheet number five. Worksheet number five is found on page 24 in uh, the workbook. And uh, please make sure that you do submit that uh, online. There will be a link in, in the email that I send out that'll take you to the worksheet where you can put all of your answers in um, and, and get the answers. All right. Okay, uh, that will do it then, uh, I think, with, uh, with this lesson, lesson number uh, five. Uh, I hope that, that uh, these lessons are going well uh, for you and smoothly. If not, uh, please let me know and I'll uh, do whatever I can to, uh, to help. Uh, if you have any questions about the content of, of the lessons, if you want to uh, ask about some of the things that we've been talking about, uh, again, feel free to get in touch with me. I'd be happy to help you in that way as well. All right, have a wonderful day and God bless.